and we are back after quite a hiatus um we are back taking a look at colossians uh welcome back uh sorry i know many of you enjoy uh taking it uh, just a few minutes 15 minutes or so every day to just read some scripture together um so um i apologize for the week and a half absence that we've had of these daily moments um it, it's been kind of busy uh, with some counseling appointments last week i actually got a little overwhelmed to be honest uh and between that and um just some great great stuff that was going on some teaching i was prepping for and preparing for the roman series and all those other things which god in his divine providence did not have me start last sunday um so uh de definitely some some curves and stuff thrown in there but um getting back into a little bit more of a pattern or routine uh starting uh yesterday and today uh so looking forward at uh going forward and doing these again uh each day and taking a look at the scripture uh, i'm just recognizing that my uh formatting here hold on it's just a little bit off so i want to help you out with that because part of the goal and the reason why we're doing it the way that we do it is so that way you can actually see the text and you can interact with the text yourself um you know part of the point of what i want to be doing with these daily moments is helping you readily and and daily be reading the scriptures for yourself so um that's that's the intention of this um because as i'm diving into the text i want to bring it back to you uh and uh any way i can so anyway so welcome back thanks for joining uh, i know that we have at least one live viewer so thank you um <clears throat> so anyways um we're going to be looking at uh, colossians chapter 2 verse 6 picking up where we left off just to kind of give you uh, a little backdrop uh we just finished talking about what everything is in christ uh, that's where we were in Colossians. If you want to kind of refresh her, you could certainly go back and listen to uh, the last recording, which I believe was Friday, a week and a half ago. Um, and uh, you could get kind of the indication on where we're going to stop. Um, but we're going to be picking up the idea in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. We're going to go down to verse 23 today. And there's so much in this text, again, that we're not going to deal with. Um, but we'll just try to get the major points of it. So um, read along and follow along as we go. And uh, let's take a look at the text. Uh, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And in him, you also were, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them into open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you for questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in the details about visions and puffed up without reason by his sinuous mind. And not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you dine to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And we're going to stop there. Uh, this text in this section is extremely important. In fact, I can't emphasize how important uh, this, emphasis, this, this specific section of text is in, in the daily practice of Christian lives in the religion of, of Christians, um, because this, is, this gives us a lot of information. In fact, and just in my reading, and just in reading this text, you may be thinking of tons of circumstances, of things that you've seen, people who are professing the name of Christ, but they're doing some of the things that are actually specifically taught against in this passage. And so I want to kind of talk about that a little bit. And first, uh, in the beginning part of this section, verse 6, it says, Therefore, if you receive Christ in the Lord, so walk in him. There is this element to which, as you have received Christ, well, and that's all talked about above. And it's going to talk about again. Paul's going to talk about again here in a few moments. Um, but 
you know, there's this element of receiving Christ, that you've received uh, the work of Christ on your behalf by faith. And so he says, so walk in Christ. And this becomes uh, what we're going to see in chapter 3 of Colossians is also what we see in chapter 4 of Ephesians, uh, this idea of walking in Christ. And this is, this is to be rooted and built up in him. That means by which you find your base, where your root, like a plant, like a tree, you're rooted in. What are you rooted into? You're rooted into Christ. And as you're building up, you're being built it up in him, established in the faith, the faith once handed down from all the saints, from the apostles and prophets about Jesus, just as you were taught. And with that, as you're being rooted and built up in Christ, established in that faith, you're giving thanksgiving. There's so much there that we could talk through and, and how that how that element is important. But this is the piece that you need to understand, uh, that this is important, that you continue to grow in the knowledge of your faith and you continue to pursue after the wisdom and the full stature of Christ and everything that Christ is in the scriptures and how he, he's revealed in the scriptures and, and how he comes to life in your own life through your prayer life and through your time spent in devotions to him. Um, because verse 8 happens... See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and according to the elemental spirits of this world and not according to Christ. Look, there are tons of Christians who are taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit in, a, in human tradition. Um, the, it happens all the time where we've, we don't know enough about Christ. We don't know enough about his word. We don't know enough about what God has revealed in his scriptures. And we begin believing something that's human. We begin believing something that's empty. We begin believing some sort of philosophy that doesn't submit itself to Christ. And so because of that, we end up walking in a manner that's not worthy of the gospel that we've been called. And so first, we have to, we have to protect ourselves and edge ourselves and be careful to not find ourselves taken captive by a philosophy or some sort of deceit that's from the devil, and that's according to human tradition. And I'm going to say something that might be a little unpopular with some of my listeners, but let me tell you this. There are certain things in the political sphere uh, that is tr human tradition and empty deceit. And if we're not careful and, and we buy into certain things and we, we follow those things to their inevitable end and we don't necessarily submit them unto Christ, we, we may be following the wrong thing. We may be captive by a philosophy or something that's in human tradition. Now, verse 9 says, again, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. If you need a passage that talks about the deity of Christ, here is one. Jesus, everything that makes God God is in Jesus. This is similar to what we see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where he says that he's the exact imprint of the nature of God, the Father. And so the, this is the whole idea. Christ is God. Jesus is God. And this is an early attestation of Paul saying this in a letter that most people do not say that Paul did not write. They say he did write it. Uh, Jesus is God. Early development, something early in Christianity, not something that happened over time. Verse 10, it says, and you have been filled in him. If you are in the church, if you have received him, if you have received Christ, you are been filled in him. You are, you are his. And he is the head of all rule and authority. We talked about that uh, both in Wednesday night services, if you're with us on Wednesday nights, but also we talked about that just even last week in Colossians. Verse 11, in him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Romans talks about this explicitly, that the circumcision that was being done, which is cutting off the foreskin of the males of Israel, that which was done with hands, God has done to you in a different way. The whole point was this is a, an act and with hands that is done to set you aside and say that you are God's and you are God's chosen people. Now you have been circumcised of the heart. You've had a circumcision of Christ that you have been put into the body of Christ in such a way that's spiritual in nature, not physical in nature. Uh, and that now you are identified with him. And specifically verse 12, Paul gives an example of which being buried with him in baptism. And this is the idea that when we are baptized with him, we are identifying ourselves with Christ. We're saying, yes, I, I took on the death of baptism just like Christ took on his death for me. And just like Christ was raised out of the water in baptism, I will be raised with him uh, in faith in the powerful working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, verse 13 says, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Before Christ saved us, we were dead. We were dead in our sin and we had no hope. 
But God has made us alive together with him. When Christ was raised from the dead, the work has been finished, but now we have been raised with him. And look at this, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. Look, when we sin, we have, there's a legal demand for our sin. There's this thing that's owed to us because of the sin that we've committed, and that thing is death. But by Christ's death, all of our trespasses have been forgiven. All of the debts that we owed God because of our sin that resulted in our, our need for death, God has canceled the punishment of our sins and the payment of our sins. Uh, beloved, if you are in Christ, you will not pay for one of your sins. If God disciplines you, it's not punishment for your sin. He's disciplining you to conform you into the image of his son, Jesus. But he doesn't continue to punish believers for their sins because all of the punishment is taken on by Christ. That's something we have to understand. He set aside the legal demand. He set it aside. He nailed it to the cross. He disarmed then the rulers and authorities. This is this is talking about those, those earthly demonic ruler and authorities we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit later in another section uh, in, in uh, Ephesians. But he disarmed them and he put them to open shame because they killed the Christ. But that didn't stop Jesus because he triumphed over him in his resurrection. And that's what we celebrate in every Easter. Verse 16. So then Paul says there's an implication of this. There's an implication of this cancellation of debt and, and the punishment no longer being uh, applied to you because God's not punishing people according to their sins. He's, he's taking them according to Christ. He says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. And now this is probably in reference to the Jews passing judgment on the Gentiles. Because in the Colossae, we're probably primarily talking about Gentile believers. And so there are certainly Jewish people here. But so he's saying, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are in reference specifically to the festivals that were practiced by people who are Jewish, the, the shadow of things that were to come, all the things that God had set up specifically designed in order to encourage and help people understand the truths of what ultimately was going to be fulfilled in Christ. He says, don't let people pass judgment on you when you don't practice in the same way that they do. That's, that's what verse 16 is. Okay. Now this isn't, don't judge anybody. This is don't judge people on this issue, okay? Because these related issues, festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, when you do the Sabbath, how you do the Sabbath, whether or not you take a day for the Lord or not, those are all shadows of things to come. That's why Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, when the disciples are doing things on the Sabbath, right? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. They all belong to him. The substance of what those things are shadows of, those are shadows of Christ. And so verse 18, Paul says, let no one disqualify you. That means that you can't be part of Christ. You can't have any of his blessings. You can't have anything to do with him if you're not doing aestheticism. Now, let me see if I can uh, pull up. I didn't know if I didn't, I didn't pre-plan this here. Here we go. Uh, so this is low nitta. I'm going to try to zoom in here. So this is uh, quality of humility. Humble attitude, humility without arrogance. Okay. So this, this is an idea of humility. Now, what's interesting is, is that um, in, in Lomita specifically has a conversation regards in Colossians 2.19 or 2.18, uh, which is where we're at. Uh, this idea of humility, insisting on humility, this is of humble lifestyle, which is actually false. It's a false life, uh, uh, humility. It, this is the asceticism that we saw that the monks got into, where they would not own a single thing. Uh, they refrained from having anything of pleasure. Uh, all of those things, okay? Now, there are people in Christian circles today that insist that Christians must be poor and in poverty, because uh, if they're not, then they're not real Christians. Uh, and, and that's not true. Uh, God blesses sometimes, and, and what we should do is be wise with the wealth that God gives us and give and not be pursuing after wealth as a means or an end. Um, so specifically, insisting on asceticism is not something Christians should do. And look at this, the worship of angels. Now look, uh, this could be worship of angels as in the messengers, as in the people who are giving the message, because that's what the word angels mean as messengers, or it could be spiritual beings. Uh, I think in the context of spiritual beings, uh, given what's said next, um, but either way, we shouldn't be worshiping anyone other than Christ. We should not be worshiping anyone other than God, right? And so I think the veneration of saints that occurs in the Catholic Church would be a prime example of something that should not be going on specifically related to what's going on here. Notice what it says next, going on in detail about visions and puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. 
Uh, this is referring to people who, they, they, they talk about visions that they've had of Christ, of visions that they've seen of him, visions of things, angels, and visions of heaven. They go into detail about all of these things, and they're puffed up without reason because they're of sensuous mind, right? Uh, and so Paul is warning against these things. Don't let people disqualify you because they say, well, I've had this experience, right? Uh, and we, we, we're not necessarily saying that those experiences don't exist. We're not necessarily saying those experiences are false, uh, although that may be true. Um, but we're not, going to, we're not going to disqualify others because you've had some sort of experience. Uh, instead, we're going to hold fast to the head, to Christ, right? That's the point, because growth comes from God, and we're going to focus everything on Christ. Uh, so verse 20, if in Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why are you, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. And this is in reference specifically to the um, laws of, uh, the Jewish laws specifically reserving to what types of food they're allowed to have. Um, and so um, it, specifically with this, though, there's another element, a larger element to this, um, that there were additional laws that were created by the Jewish people in the first century. And because if you notice, it's not even necessarily saying to according to godly principles and teachings, right? That's not the law. This isn't reference to the law. Otherwise, he would have just said according to the law. He, he was specifically referring to human precepts and teachings. This is when people extend the law into other avenues and put you in subjection to it. And he's saying, look, if people are adding human precepts and human teachings to the law, you do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Those, those are not things that you have to follow. Because although they have the appearance of wisdom, verse 23, in promoting, it's in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Ultimately, no matter how aesthetic you try to live, no matter how much you try to create all these laws to prevent you from doing the wrong things, and, you know, I'm not going to take anything good, I'm not going to eat this, I'm not going to eat that, I'm not going to have any of this, those kind of things is self-made religion and ascetity making severity against your body, but they don't stop the indulgence of the flesh. What does is submission to Christ and submission to him and submission to what he wants and following after him. And that's what Paul's going to detail next in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 and following. Uh, I'm sorry, in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and following. Put on the new self. So that's where we're going to pick up tomorrow. God bless you all. I hope you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday. If you're able to make it tonight, we'd love to have you tonight. Love to have you come out. And uh, we're going to be doing uh, Ephesians chapter 2, hopefully getting from verse 1 to verse 10 tonight. So we'd love to have you. Uh, God bless you all. Have a great Wednesday. Take care.